I started taking in clients on the side and uh, a lot of the time when I would check in with them, they're like, I don't know, I'm not like, I love the tea you made me. Like I know when I drink it, I feel good. It's just like, yeah. I want to have like a glass of wine or like a cold beer after work. I'm not mm. going to like sit and make my tea. Yeah. And I was like, I Interesting. feel you. Yeah. Like, and at I this time you weren't, you, you weren't drinking craft beer, right? Right. And I was so. like drinking a lot more wine and like I was making my teas and like adding like seltzer water and like, you know, like quality, like organic mezcal or, or vodka to it. And so I was really like not interested in the beer options that were out there. And so I was like, I wonder if I can just start putting the plants into the beer. Like, totally. Is that a thing? And so I found this book. It's called Sacred and Healing Herbal Beers. And it was written in the 90s. It's a it's a gorgeous sort of um, exploration of, like, the history of our brewing um, mm. from ancient ferments all the way up until, like, the 18 and 1900s. But it is trying to paint the picture of how we were not confined to the ingredients that we're confined to now. Okay. Because now... How so? Well, there's sort of two parts to that. One is um, the way people were brewing, even, like, 20,000 years ago, is obviously, like, what was available, like, right. readily available mm-hmm. outside their door. Or right. Their, I see. You know, there were no imported ingredients or no, anything like that. No, and, you know, we have, like, nature has always been growing, like, medicinal plants like mm-hmm. wildly and abundantly all around where humans are and they were taking those and they knew how to decide if something was you know poisonous or psychotropic or just delicious and culinary and so that was what they were fermenting it was that and sugars and they these were open vessels that like wild yeast would come and in some wow. cultures they would like say prayers or sing songs that they believe like called in these magical yeasts like wow. and they would ferment their beverages for them and and that was the way it was done for a long time even in the 1300s 1400s witches yeah where witches were brewing for their communities ale wives um ale wives they're called ale um hence the name here we yeah. have the, is, yeah. tell us about the name yeah. i feel like this I, is I a will, perfect segue I will, <laughs> I will tell you about the name well, they analyzed all these women. They were like going and they would like commune in circles. Like this imagery of like the witches that were burned. They were like communing in nature and they were coming together and saying like, oh, I found like this patch of like, you know, mugwort over here. Like we'll all go gather it together. They were and just they were misunderstood. for themselves and brewing for their They didn't wear those hats though, did they? They did wear the hats. They oh, wore they, the hats so that did. when they went to markets, they, they could fill them up. People knew that they were they were oh. identifiers. It was like a marketing tool. And you could see that above yeah. anybody in the crowd. Yeah. It was it right out. I feel like they were so misunderstood. Here they are trying to help people, and they're condemned as trying to hurt people and cause right. problems. Right. Yeah. And so that hmm. leads me to the other point of, of this is that um, there was an act called the German Beer Purity Act. Hmm. And it was written, and I think it was around 15... 19 or something like that and it said that well when they wrote it it actually said the only ingredients that can go into beer moving forward are barley hops and water and when was this written uh in the early 50s that is so that is crazy how long did that remain the case that's still the case it's still the case so why did they determine that i mean if all these other things could be put in it well I know there's two theories. One okay. is that there was a monopoly on these goods, um, like the monks oh. and the church had a monopoly on a lot of these goods and they wanted to force people to use these ingredients. The other is that um, some of these plants that I'm referencing have the effect to really lift people up out of their own bodies um, to help them shift consciousness and to make them feel like more excited or more sexy or whatever it is that they're feeling when they're drinking alcohol. Is that what I'm feeling right now? That's what it is? (laughs) Whereas hops are a sedative. Um, If you ask me as an herbalist, someone that didn't know anything about beer, what do hops good for? I'm like, they're not that good for you. I mean, if you needed like surgery back in the day, you would want to drink some strong hop tea and try to like put yourself to sleep. Yeah. Um, That's so interesting. Beer makes me tired traditionally, except for Corona. But (laughs) There's a Czech style of beer too, right? Huh? Like a Czech style of making beer? Well, there's all kinds of... Is like, it the same ingredients, though? Just different process? Right. So okay. those, have, those have been adopted as, like, what malt beverage, what beer can be. Mm. Is they must contain these ingredients. And we really, like, lost... Set. I mean, yes, we can... There are so many styles. I mean, the in the U.S., like, our beer competitions, it's, like, over 100 styles wow. that you can create with those ingredients. Um, 
because you know we're, we're still adding fruit we're still adding yeah. spices occasionally we have all you know we have labs now where we can have so many types of yeast available and overnighted to us so yes there's still so many possibilities but we're not actually infusing any of our ferments with all these really aromatic and medicinal plants anymore until now until now